Hi everybody, I'm Scott Swan. I recently had a chance to sit down with Jeff Smullyan, the founder of Emma's Communications. I wanted to talk with him about his new book and his lengthy career in the radio business here in Indianapolis. Smolian oversaw dozens of radio stations all across the country. He started the first all sports talk radio station and he managed high profile personalities over the years, including David Letterman, Don Imus and Mike Pence. Smolian's book goes over the highs and lows of his career. Here's our conversation. Why did you call the book Never Ride a Roller Coaster Upside Down? Scott, it's because when I thought about my life, it's really been, a, I always say life's a roller coaster ride. Uh, and mine has been crazy enough that it was upside down. Mm. So that's why I did that. And, uh, and uh, it, it, when, I, when I look at life, it really is a roller coaster ride. There was a, a famous uh, Steve Martin movie where at the last scene, um, he turns to his grandmother and she said, it's just a roller coaster ride. Mm -hmm. And it really is. So I've, uh, and when I thought about mine, it's been a little crazier than most. Is your roller coaster coming to the end? Are you toward the end? Where are you on that roller coaster? Well, at my age, with my age, you know, as, as they say in golf, I'm, I'm pretty close to the end of the 18th fairway. I'm not on the first green. Um, you know, I don't know. I'll keep doing it forever. I love what I do. I love the people that I work with. It's been fun every day. Uh, there have been some days where you just want to hit your head against the wall, but I've loved every bit of it. B best day of your life in this business has well, been Well, I mean, having kids is still the best day of your life. Mm. Having kids is also the worst days of your life sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I mean, you know, there have been some great successes. I think when Power 106 took off, when the first radio station took off, uh, when we had some great results in St. Louis, um, certainly when WFAN became successful. So there have been an awful lot of great days. What's the best decision you've made in business? I think the, creating the kind of culture that I wanted to have, and I think everything that's been good has emanated from having a culture that, I, that I'm very proud of. Mm. What about the worst decision that you've made in your business career? Oh, always having too much debt. Uh, and if you read the book, there are also some incredibly stupid decisions. Um, my friend David Stern offered us an NBA team when we got out of baseball, and I turned him down because I said, look, I have to fix Emmis. Uh, I probably always would have made that decision because Emmis was always my first love. Uh, but my friend Jerry Reinsdorf said that may be the single worst decision in American business history. Um, we had... Um, we had a, a chance to merge with some companies. Uh, Sam Zell came to us with a deal where he would merge his company with mine. And, and I said, look, if I just wanted to make the most money, I'd do this in a heartbeat. Because I know that you'll know when this business is topped out and you'll come to me and say, we're selling. Mm -hmm. And we'll make a lot of money, but I love what I do. Uh, and I want to keep doing it. Why was it radio stations for you? I always loved it. When I was a kid, I would listen to ball games and I'd listen to Top 40 radio um, all the time. I was of the era where we had transistor radios. Now, most of the people watching this won't have any idea what a transistor radio is. But those were the first portable radios and uh, kids would, you know, put them under their pillows at night and listen to the hits or listen to ball games. And I was of that generation. And at the height of Emmis, yeah. how many radio stations did you own? Probably at 30 or 40, but we didn't, we didn't go for hundreds, but they were 30 or 40 big, big radio stations. So we were in New York and Los Angeles and Chicago and Austin and San Francisco, uh, Washington, Boston. So we were, we were in the biggest markets with, with really pretty big radio stations. You've had some amazing radio personalities that you've worked with. Yeah. Who would be on your Mount Rushmore of radio personalities? Well, you have to have Don Imus up there. Um, you know, Don, one of the great talents of all time. Chris Russo and Mike Francesa. Um, the late Jay Thomas. Um, big boy in Los Angeles. Um, I, I would say probably some of our people in St. Louis um, uh, would, would be there. Uh, there's been so many of them. Um, you know, a lot of the people here. Mm. Uh, Don Imus, give me a Don Imus story. What was he like to work with? He was a curmudgeon. My friend Randy Bongarten, who had run NBC, when we first bought it, I said, tell me the difference, because he managed Don, Don Imus and Howard Stern at the same time. And he said, Howard is the most fascinating guy of all because he's very clinical. He will do things that are right up to the edge of major problems with the FCC. 
And then at 10 o'clock, he'll give you a clinical analysis of why he went to this point, but not to this point. He says, he's the most rational person I've ever dealt with, totally unlike what you see on the air. So Don, on the other hand, is just kind of a curmudgeon. Um, it's not exactly the word Randy used. I always liked Don a lot, and I had, had some moments with him, uh, one where he got into a battle with the, um, the Tisch family that owned CBS, uh, and it also bought the New York Giants. And a friend of mine who was the head lobbyist for CBS said, the Tishes want to go after your license. Um, but I said, I know Jeff. Let me call Jeff. Because uh, they were furious about a bit that uh, Don had done, which insulted the family. And I said, look, I, I can call Don. And he'll do one or two things. He'll either say, Jeff, you've never asked for a favor before, so I'll back off. Or he'll be incensed that the, the Tishes came to you. Uh, and he'll make it 50 times worse. Mm. So I told my friend Marty, you make the call, and he called me the next day and said, well, call Don. Called Don, and Don you know, backed off, and we had a great relationship. He was a brilliant man. Did you hire uh, Howard Stern as well? No, did not hire. Well, we put Howard Stern on the air here, but I, that's another story that yeah. um, my friend Randy was very close to Howard Stern, and at one point when I was in Seattle, uh, Randy called me and said, Howard's not happy. He'd like to come to Emmis. And I said, I got all these problems with baseball, and the financial world of radio is getting bad. Do I really want the aggravation of Howard Stern? Another one of my unwise decisions. Uh, Howard's a brilliant, brilliant guy. Mm. So you wish that you had hired? Well, you know, in retrospect, you know, you look at Howard, and I mean, having said that, Howard, when he worked at CBS, um, they probably paid about $5 million of FCC fines because of Howard. So there are always mixed you know, emotions about things like that. Okay, let me ask you about some of the radio personalities that you did hire. Yeah. David Letterman. Well, David was as brilliant as anybody ever. Um, I love David. You know, I saw him as a weatherman on Channel 13 uh, and thought he was amazing. Uh, my brother said, you got to hire Letterman. And uh, we were, Dave and I are the exact same age. Hired him. Um, it, w it was a show that was geared to people our age. I had friends, my friend David Clapper worked at his father's liquor store, and he said, me and about 30 of my friends just sit there and listen to Letterman all day. The 70-year-old 70 70 year people listening to talk radio were bewildered. Uh, you know, I'll never forget one of my favorite stories, and I think it's in the book, is I came back from lunch one day, and um, a caller called and said, you know Letterman's a communist. And I said, well, why, why would you say that? And he said, well, I called him and said, I know they're a communist, Oliver Carmel. And Letterman said, well, I think you've got to give him Carmel. The, the roads are awful. You can never find good parking, and their football team's terrible. He said, let's give him Carmel and hold the line at Nora. Um, and David would do stuff like that all the time. I'm, we're sitting here looking at the monument, and one day he, he said, uh, the city of Indianapolis has sold the monument to Guam. And in exchange, we're getting a 350-foot celery stalk. And people are calling and saying, we love the monument. What do, what do we need celery for? And David said, well, make downtown much greener. So he just he was brilliant. And, uh, and we stayed in touch. David ended up coming on our board. And uh, I don't see him that much anymore. But one of the most brilliant people that I've ever known. Mike Pence was a, a radio personality. Mike was a radio Pence, a radio personality. Always got along well with Mike. Uh, he always used to say, I'm, I'm uh, a calm, kind, kind version of Rush Limbaugh. Chuck Lofton was a uh, member of the MS family, I think, for yes. 16 years, right? Yeah. Doing weather. And uh, um, we've, we've had some amazing people here yeah. and fun people. And, uh, and I think that's the, 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 what you learn is yeah. it's always the people. Mm -hmm. You know, Scott, that, that's what you really learn. It's the people. Got to ask you about Dan Dockich. Right. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm a big Dockich fan uh, of, of his, uh, he's got an incredible talent, incredible insight. Uh, I, I just talked to him. Um, if I were his brother, I would have said, Dan, here's what you just can't do, uh, which he did. Um, you know, Dan goes over lines that I just don't quite understand, and yet I think he's a remarkable talent. You, you oversaw Dan, Dan when yeah. he was... And in it the was radio show, and there was a couple of controversies a lot, there. A lot of times, and there were a lot of times when we really, really debated making a change. Um, Why didn't you? 
Well, to be honest, part of it was that we knew that we were going to in discussions to sell the station, mm. and we thought that that should not be our decision. Yeah. Because um, we were in discussions. We we were in discussions for quite a while about selling it. Why did you decide to sell? I love the business more than anybody. It'll it'll always be my first love, but we realized we weren't big enough to make an impact, and the industry had declined enough that uh, I have a favorite saying that you, you, when you're pushing water uphill, it wears you out. Warren Buffett used to say, give me an impossible project and great people, and three years later, I'll show you a project that's still impossible and worn out great people. And I think our group of people are people who really like to do things that can grow. And we felt that you might be able to grow on radio. Other people might, but we felt that our time had, had come for us to vacate. Why is there a challenge with radio? Well, you have so much fragmentation in the world. You know, you've got uh, uh, you've got streaming, you've got podcasting, you've got all sorts of fragmentation and various alternatives for people. And the industry also caused itself problems with deregulation. Um, with deregulation, you took on you had mega companies that had monumental debt, um, and that debt was okay when the industry was growing at six, seven, eight percent a year. But when the industry is flat to down, that debt becomes monumental. And it's why most of my peers, the largest peers, went bankrupt. Uh, a couple of them have gone bankrupt twice. Um, and we were fortunate. We were able to survive. But we said, you know, um, in an industry that's just not having growth, it doesn't mean it's an industry that doesn't matter to people. And I believe radio will always matter to people. But it's not going to have growth for the foreseeable future. And we'd like to be in businesses that grow again. So what do you tell a young person who wants to be a radio personality, wants to be the next Don Imus? What do you, what do well, you tell that I, person? I think, I think there will always be a place for talent. I think there will always be a place for people who connect with other people. Mm. And, and that's what's fun to see. When you see a personality in a radio station that connects with its community and with its audiences. Um, so I think there will always be a place for that. It may not be very good growth, um, but it can still be a place that can be profitable. Uh, I think the key is if your company doesn't have too much debt, um, then you can do things that are a little bit more creative. Mm -hmm. You know, when you've got to run 14 or 15 commercials an hour to service your debt, um, that makes it very, very tough. What is the future of all sports radio? I think all sports is a little bit brighter um, because you, you don't have... Um, the, you don't have the, the level of competition from the Spotify's and, and, the, and the Sirius XM's when you're doing local all sports. So I think sports and talk both can do a little bit better. Um, and, and again, I think localism's the key. When you can matter to people in your community, listen, you know, I've been doing all sports interviews for this book uh, around the country, but you know, when you're here and people can talk about you know, the offensive line of the Colts, and, uh, you know, and, and Benedict Matherin of the Pacers and go on and on and debate about coaching changes and drafts. Uh, and it's local. It matters a lot. Would professional baseball ever work in Indianapolis? No. Why not? We are too small. I studied that before we ever bought the Mariners. I was part of the Art Gotti's group, the Arrows. I was a peripheral part of that and helped worked on that. And what you learn is we, baseball is a game of, you know, of cable television revenues. It's a game of disposable income, how many suites you can sell. I actually had a chance uh, a number of years after we left the Mariners to buy a team and move it here. Um, and we probably could have gotten it approved even though there was a territorial issue with the Reds. And I just, and a, and a friend of mine said, do you really want to do this? Do you want to be the smallest team market in baseball with the, by far the worst economics. And, you know, the problem is we are very fortunate to have the Colts and Pacers. This town, it, we all we talk about ourselves being the 20th market. We're really about the 38th metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond that, we if you go 50 miles to your south, you're in Reds territory. And if you go 75 miles to the north, you're in Cubs and White Sox territory. Terre Haute's always been a, a Cardinals area. And Fort Wayne's pretty much, you know, been the Indians and the Tigers. So your TV market would be very, very limited. Um, and, and to have three sports teams in this town, I think, I think baseball, it, it just wouldn't work. Okay, so just so I understand, you had a chance to bring a major league team yeah. to Indianapolis? Yes. Who is that? 
It was it was the Expos. The Expos. Yeah, there was. We were in discussions, and it was a discussion about before the Expos, before they, the, before the owners basically went on and took the Marlins. And baseball didn't know what to do with the Expos and what they were going to do with it. Put them in Washington, but I had a discussion with some people in the game. How serious were you? Not that serious, Not that because serious. when I thought about it a lot, uh, first I said, "Could it be done?" And the comment was, "Yeah, it could be done." Yeah. And then the then I thought, it, 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 "Does this math ever really work?" Did you ever have a chance, or were there ever any discussions in your career about purchasing the Pacers from the Simons or the Colts from the Ursays? There were some discussions about both, I think, but nothing ever serious. Yeah. I think at one point uh, there was a talk that Jimmy might want to move, and, and a few of us said, Jimmy, before you move, you know, we'll put a group together to do it. But, yeah. but I think Jimmy loves that team, and I think Herbie loves his team. And, uh, Herb, you know, b both are friends. Herbie's a very dear friend. You could have built MS anywhere. Why did you choose Indianapolis? This is home. Um, I went to USC, undergraduate in law school, and when I first, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I'd looked at some stations out there with some friends, and my dad basically said, you need to come home. I want you to come home. And he had a cousin who had a small station that was having troubles, and he said, if you'll come back and run this while you're waiting to start your company, uh, come home. And when I first did it, he talked me into it. Um, I thought, why have I done this? Uh, and about six months later, I just fell in love with this place. And I have been teased for the years. People, why are you not in New York? Why are you not in L.A.? Why are you not in San Francisco, Washington, Chicago? This is home, and I'm proud of it. Um, it's given me a chance to be involved in a lot of things that have helped this community, hopefully. Uh, it's given me a chance to see uh, a place that I think is, I hate to use this phrase, punched above its weight, but we really have. Um, we don't have a lot of natural resources. We don't have oceans or mountains. Uh, we don't have the Sun Belt. But we've had a, com company of, a community of people who've cared about it. Mm. Uh, and I'm proud of having played a small part in trying to make it a better place. So what is it like now selling your business, yeah. the radio stations, the yeah. TV stations, Indianapolis Monthly? Yeah. What, what, what is that like for you? Well, it's bittersweet. but. We're fortunate. At our height, we had almost $2 billion of debt. We paid off all of our debt. We have money in the bank. We are energized. Uh, I'm, I'm surrounded by people who want to go out and, and, and do more fun things. We have three businesses now that I'm proud of that we think have a chance to grow nicely. We'll probably buy, if anybody's watching this and wants to sell us a business, we're probably buyers. Um, and, and I'm energized. And I, you know, I'd like this to be a larger company. Um, and we'll see what happens. But I, um, but I love what I do, and I love the people I do it with.